The wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week. And what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nikki Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nikki, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nikki, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I can say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, and went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home. Change your shirt. Let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family. Had no thoughts of God. Been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the sun. Remember that, that, just that one statement. Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, somebody had gone to him told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, laid his hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Challenge, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea that because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now, this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me, traveling, trying to raise funds, trying to keep the whole thing afloat and centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and, and in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting and I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart, you love Him with everything that's in you, and, and you fast, you pray, you seek Him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up. Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. And I'm standing there after the meeting in despair, watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers, drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital. She was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her, and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, it, she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I did? I closed and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still and let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so. And I went there, and you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and that's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In, in fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight, 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. I want you to go to Romans 8. I want you to go to Romans 8. The eighth chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. In other words, I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, Being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely. You came to the Lord, he decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it through the day of Christ. He's not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be holy. You'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach. You can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach. You say, I'll never... I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it, uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit, wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they said, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil. And you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness. And the devil going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've, got, we've got a condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now, when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children. And I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorce and say, I divorce you, go on out on your own? When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles, I'm going through your trials. Hold fast. Now notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolated as an island. Some of you are sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, the, the, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes past, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning I tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastor said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or some. Yeah, there. Give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid? So afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I want to, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is, is, of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, a, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous, 1 Peter 3, 8. You know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve, two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this... Lord, who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said, those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said, we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority. Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long suffering. Paul preached with that long suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this. He's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church. Look at verse Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking to Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I uh, would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd right, look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spill you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spill you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backsliding, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spill you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had Scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spew you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spew out of my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, Especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times, look, I've tried, I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, did, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes. I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I should have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. Remember, remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far? Some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't, I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else, but I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? Where was his father? His father was looking for him, waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you, but he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself, say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you you see the picture, composite picture. One day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. Do you know the, that's Jesus? That he comes after you, you take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spin every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, your older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Let's know what he told him. What did he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me. I'll receive you. I'll make you righteous. All you have to do is get up and come. Come home. Come home. Come home. Lord Jesus, I feel your love tonight for this people. Truly you love us. You love us with an undying love. Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit's touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying a load of sin or guilt or habit, and you say, Brother, I want to come home. I've got to come. I need His love tonight. 
I'm tired of sin. I want to repent, but I want to be restored to His love. Let's all stand, please, so people can get out of the aisles. Satisfied sinners. I'm thinking tonight of a young mother I used to see pushing a baby carriage up in Harlem, and it bothered me because she had black and blue marks on her. And she stopped me one day and said, aren't you the man working with drug addicts? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, then, sir, you've got to get to my husband, Hector. He's one of the worst drug pushers. He's a maniac. He beats me up. He abuses the baby. He's going to kill us. Please get to him. Now, we usually don't work like that. We prefer they get desperate and come to us for help. But out of pity for that mother, we went to Hector and told him about our program and said, when you get desperate, come and see me. And a few weeks later, in a point of desperation, Hector came. We took him into the program. It lasted eight months to a year. And while Hector was in the program, in a rehabilitation program, I'd see his wife, Carla, in the streets. And she'd say, how's Hector doing? And say, Carla, we're going to send a new man back to your home. He's going to be the father and husband he should be. He's going to have love in his heart. And friends, that's exactly what happened. Eight months later, we sent Hector home, a Bible under one arm and a box of candy under the other. And I'll tell you, it gave me joy to know that we were sending a young man home that wasn't a maniac. Now, he wasn't a drug daddy. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. But more than that, he said he was going all the way with Christ. I felt so good about it. Two weeks later, I got the shock of my life. I was walking in a back alley, worked with some junkies, and there's Hector on the corner, on the curb, dirty, filthy, back on the needle, worse than ever. I was horrified. I said, Hector, what in the world happened to you? He said, why don't you go home and ask my wife, Carla? I said, what do you mean? He said, David, I went home determined I was going to live it. He said, but you know, I got home, my wife's a chain smoker, and it bothered me. I said, look, Carla, I, I can quit drugs and smoking. I can expect you to quit blowing smoke in my face. I want you to quit smoking, and I want you to quit running around with all those wicked housewives on the block of those parties, and I want you to quit drinking. She blew up at me, he said. He, she said, who in the world do you think you are? Why, you dirty, filthy sinner. You come in here now and get a little religion and come in here and start preaching at me. She said, you make me nervous. I don't like you like this. I like you better the way you were before. And boy, she started henpecking him and henpecking him for two weeks, trying to seduce him back to the needle, and went out finally and bought two bags of heroin, threw it on the kitchen table with a set of work, said, shoot it up. I want you back the way you were. He said, David, I couldn't face it myself. I need help at home. I couldn't fight it alone. And to this day... I don't understand why a young housewife in Harlem prefers a drug addict crazed husband to a man of God. And yet, see, Carla was satisfied in her sins. The light that he'd received condemned her darkness, and she'd have nothing to do with it. I'm thinking, too, of another uh, situation when I had heard of a young boy living like a dog in a basement. They described it to him, and I couldn't believe it. A 17-year-old boy whose parents had died when he was 12 years old, he'd run away because he didn't want the welfare department to put him in institution. He found an old tenement house, a dilapidated tenement house, and the superintendent let him sleep in the basement if he'd do some chores and take care of the furnace. And the boy was 17 years old when I found him, a heroin addict, and I went in the basement, a dark, dirty, rat, and roach-infested basement, filthy, damp, and dark. And there in a corner, he had it fixed up like a little room. He had a pile of rags that he slept on. He had a calendar on the wall that was two years old, a picture of his mother and a candle. And this was his room. I looked around, and there he was, sitting over in another corner, high as he could be. His eyeballs were yellow. He was full of hepatitis and jaundice, 17 years old, an animal. He hadn't bathed in months. He ate junk food, robbed and stole for money to support his habit. We picked that boy up. I couldn't believe that in America we had kids living like dogs. I picked him up. We put him in the car and took him to the center and cleaned him up. Uh, the cook got him a good hot meal. The first hot meal he'd had, I'm sure, in months. Took him into the chapel. Showed him what Christ had done for other junkies. He, he said, I want to try. 
And friends, that night at midnight, we put Manny to bed in new pajamas, beautiful clean sheets, nice downy soft pillow, and two boys to stay up with him all night to help him kick cold turkey, wipe the sweat from his brow to pray with him. And I'd been gone a few weeks and went down to my office after putting him in the room with the boys, and I was dictating some letters in a dictaphone machine about 2 o'clock. I flipped it off and leaned back in the chair, and I thought of that boy up in that room, and I thought of boys like Nicky Cruz, and I thought, now, Lord, that's pure religion and undefiled. And there's nothing in the world that brings such a sense of, of, of fulfillment as to be a part of this wonderful scheme of God's grace. And I thought, oh, Lord, if, with all the problems, this makes it worth at all, and I conjured in my mind uh, maybe another Nicky Cruz sending him to college, and and one day a man of God walking back in the street and saying, "There's where God found me," and I felt so good. About two o'clock or two thirty, rather, I heard a blood curdling scream. My office opened to the main lobby, and I went to the door just in time to see Manny running out the door, throwing on his clothes, screaming like a wild man. I chased him down the block. He went down the subway. A train arrived, and he went off into the night. I missed the train. Went back to the center and asked them what had happened. They said, we don't know. He, just, he was sleeping. He woke up. He grabbed his clothes, screaming, and ran. The next day, I went up to Harlem, into the basement. He wasn't there. I looked all over, all over five or six blocks, and finally found him in a little cafe, drinking a cup of coffee. He tried to run when he saw me. I said, Manny, look, why would you run out on me? Come on, my car's out there. Let's get back. He said, no, sir, and I want you to leave me alone. He said, you did a terrible thing to me last night. I said, what do you mean? He said, Miss, I don't have much left in life, but the little I've got left, you took away from me. And I, I thought of that calendar and a picture of his mother and, and uh, the candle. I thought, well, we could get that stuff if that's what he's relating to. He said, mister, and I'll never forget it, you took my security. I said, you're what? He said, my security. He said, that's just a, a, a hole in the wall to you. But he said, for four years, that's been my home, and I've grown accustomed to it. And to tell you the truth, I like it. He said, I like shooting drugs. I like living in that basement. Don't you understand? I didn't want to go with you. I was sick. He said, you fed me. That's nice. You're being a good man. You're trying to help people. That's fine. But he said, I don't want your help. Don't you understand? You put me in new pajamas, in a clean bed. I hadn't slept in a mattress for years. He said, I woke up. I was so miserable. I felt my body was crawling with worms. He said, I was miserable. He said, please, don't you understand? I'm satisfied, just the way things are. And I had to walk out after an hour. He wouldn't listen. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I got in a car, and I shook my head and said, I don't believe it, how a kid can prefer a rat-infested basement to the love we were trying to give him. And the tragedy is, friends, and this is documented in one of my books. Manny died six months later in the Brooklyn Hospital, cirrhosis of the liver. And I've never forgotten his face. You see, to me, Manny and Carla represent a whole new breed of sinner that, that we are uh, breeding in America today. I call the satisfied sinner. You see, the way I interpret my Bible, there are only two kinds of sinners. Sorry sinners and satisfied. Now, David sinned grievously against God. Yet he said, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I'll forsake my wicked ways. That's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. But you see, we have a breed of sinner in America and now. Who, who, who won't come to Christ because they have the idea in their mind that some strange, mysterious power has overwhelmed them and they can't help it. They're a victim. You see, have you ever heard this? The devil made me do it. I couldn't help it. This strange, mysterious power keeps pushing me on. I don't want to be like this, but I can't help it. Now, I've prayed about this, friends, and the Holy Spirit's been saying some things to me I want to, I want to say here tonight. First of all, there's no such thing as a victim of sin, only volunteers. Almost every drug addict that comes to us for help now has been to his local psychiatrist and he's had a perfect alibi given to him as to why he's a junkie. I had a 16-year-old kid come to me and I said, look, why does a 16-year-old kid stick a dirty needle in his vein? You're only 16 years old, you know better. He said, well, Mr. Wilkes, I'll tell you, it's very traumatic. He said... My problem is I've got interpersonal relationships, intensified anxiety states, and sibling rivalries. I said, who told you that? He said, my psychiatrist. He said, you see, Mr. Wilson, I can't help uh, what I am. I, I'm a victim of poverty. 
He said, I got caught up in the poverty syndrome. You see, I'd have preferred to have been born out in a nice suburb where there was love and a couple cars in the garage, but I got stuck in this ghetto, and I can't help it. I didn't ask to be born down here. This is where I've been put. I can't help it. Can't you see? Society put this on me. And friend, I can take you. I'm not about to tell you that poverty and unemployment and the ghetto are not contributing factors to dragging a soul down. But I can take you to Harlem and show you kids sleeping in hell. Mom's a prostitute, dad's a drug pusher, brothers and sisters are all smashed and stoned on drugs, yet that kid's a man of God and he's going to go to Bible school and preach the gospel in spite of his environment. And I can take you right here to Denver, some of the most influential suburbs, and show you beautiful one hundred and two hundred thousand dollar homes with three, four, and five cars in the driveway, and parents who love their kids and their kids going straight to hell in spite of their good environment. I'm a victim. Almost every man who who cheats on his wife today and commits adultery becomes a fornicator. Instead of calling him by his right name, a fornicator and adulterer, we try to rationalize, we try to uh, dialogue with the problem and, and try to give him an excuse. And it goes something like this. Well, now, have you seen his wife? She's a witch. Well, if you were married to that, you'd run out and find somebody to understand you too. All the man wanted was somebody to understand him. And all the cheeks in the world, and everybody says, all I want is somebody to understand me. Hogwash. Well, you city people don't know what that means. That's pig's food. I've been working with homosexuals for 20 years. We've had a home for homosexuals for 12 years now in upstate New York. A wonderful man of God, delivered from homosexuality, married now, a happy family man, and, and we baptized uh, this past year, seven that have been delivered. And I believe that Christ is the cure. But friends, out of the thousands and thousands I've ministered to, only two out of a hundred have ever been reached or helped at all because only two out of a hundred were willing to quit blaming somebody for their problem. Ask any homosexual, how did you become a homosexual? Mother did it. My mother did it. I had a mean father and I had a permissive pampering mother. You just ask my psychiatrist, he'll tell you. Mm hmm. It's almost a sin to be a parent today. Mother did it. Dad did it. My friends, this, this is all over the country now. You remember this mass homosexual murder down in Houston? 25 boys, little boys were murdered and buried in cellophane garbage bags. And I have a film clip of the police digging up those bodies. And they just captured young Henley boy who'd been a part of these murders and confessed it. And he's leaning over a police car talking on the phone to his mother. And before they even get the boy to jail, a psychiatrist is talking to reporters in Houston and saying, now this boy is a product of a permissive society. We all made him what he is. He couldn't really help it. Not a one word about the stacks of pornographic smut they found in the boy's room. Not one word of the fact that he was an alcoholic. And not one word of the fact that he'd been going to sex orgies for years. No, we made him what he was. You know, all the time I have parents come to me to ask me to visit their kids in jail. And very seldom do I get an honest parent who comes and says, David, my kid did wrong. He got in trouble. My boy's in jail. He's paying for his penalty, his crime. But I love him. Go visit him, please. Now, I respond to that kind of honesty. But you know what I get? Almost all the time. Brother Dave, please go visit my boy in jail. Or my boy wouldn't hurt a flea. So help me the persecuting him. It's a communist conspiracy. It's Watergate. That's what it is. I am so sick and tired of Watergate. You know, we've got a man sitting down in San Clemente that is acting like a second savior for the United States, and we're piled up all the national conscience on one man who's sitting there, and I'll tell you, friends, there are more hypocrites and there are more false prophets in Washington doing more now than Nixon ever did making him look like a Sunday school picnic. And I'm so sick and tired of everybody blaming everything on one man. I'm not a Nixon man, but I'm telling you, every time somebody wants to shade their own hanky-panky, Watergate! Well, friends, let me say it again. There are no victims of sin, only volunteers. My Bible says, remember the words of the apostles, how they warned you. Men should become lovers of pleasure, covetous, disobedient to parents, drawn away by the lust of their own hearts. Sensuous, separating themselves, having not the spirit. 
drawn away by the lust of their own heart, not by a pusher, not by a hooker, not by a Watergate wicked politician. Kids today who are smoking, drinking, running around and carousing and sticking needles in their veins are not running from somebody or something. They are following the lust and the dictates of their own heart. They're doing exactly what they want to do. The Bible said they're volunteers, drawn away by the lust of their own heart. They're sensuous. Americans have become sensuous. And the Bible said they separate themselves. Well, you go to a local high school party, you know what the Lord's talking about, how they separate themselves into their own little group. Well, I'm sure you don't go to high school parties, but I go wherever kids will listen. And you go to the average high school uh, or college party today, and over here in one corner, all the potheads and the pillheads are all congregated, and they're all jiving on drugs. Now, you know what jiving is, don't you? They're both, you know. And, and the shades, and always, if they're on pills or horse, they're pulling their nose and scratching their ears. And they're all jiving about drugs. See, they have a secret thing among them. They're all doing the same thing. They're all popping pills. They're sucking grass. And they're saying, hey, man, I got me joined last night. Heavy, man. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Everything. Heavy, man. And then over here in the other corner, all the six-packers. Listen. You ask, you ask any high school kid in this place right now, the biggest thing in high school in Denver, Colorado, this state in the United States, is cruising and drinking, saving up money and getting enough six packs and go cruising. You go down to your town right down here now tonight and tomorrow, hundreds and hundreds of cars, teenagers just going back and forth, drinking Coors beer and throwing the cans out the window. Hey, you hear kids saying, I'm dropping out of society. You know how the kids drop out of society in 1976? In a $7,000 Dodge van with cereal. I wish I could drop out like that. Dropping out. Then over here in the other corner, all the smoochers and the petters. And they're looking around winking at anybody. You can always find your own kind. They're always around. And they connect. And they say, hey, this party's a drag that split. Get in the car, go to local driving movie, crawl in the back seat and start making out. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They separate themselves. They're sensuous. They're drawn away by the lust of their own heart. And I've never been able to help anybody in 20 years until they say, this is my problem. And quit blaming somebody else and say, hey, look right in the mirror. And all honesty say, this is a monkey on my back. I'm responsible. It's my problem. And quit blaming somebody else for what's happened to you. There's no strange power that's overwhelmed you. No, you are drawn away by the lust of your own heart. You're doing exactly what you want to do. Secondly, the satisfied sinner continues in his sin because he doesn't believe God will ever judge him. You see, he only sees the mercy side of Christ. Oh, how people love to go to church today and hear soft, easy preaching about thinking things through in a positive way. Everything is up, is coming, roses. And oh, how we love to hear about the sympathizing Jesus. Well, if I were a sinner and I had, if I had a hang up in my mouth, I'd like to go to church and hear the preacher not jab me about my sin, but tell me how Jesus loves the sinner. And, and you see, that's a part of Christ. I've been preaching for 20 years up and down the streets of this nation around the world. I've been preaching mercy and love to sinners, prostitutes, charlots, and junkies. But friends, I know the other side. I know the goodness and the severity of God. But all there are a lot of sinners today like to hear of how Jesus, see, they picture Jesus as the he-man who understands that everybody should have a little weakness in their heart. The man who forgives heart, that's right on the spot, who goes around quoting from David, if God marked iniquities among us could stand, he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. Oh, how they like to see Jesus driving the money changers or the establishment out of the temple. They like to picture Jesus going to parties, turning water into wine. Now all the wine guzzlers in America quote that at me, and Jesus turned the water into wine. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't grape juice, that was wine. Mm. No, the world today likes to hear about the sympathizing Jesus as if to say, well, Jesus understands this weakness in me. He knows I've tried and I can't help myself. So when I get before the judgment bar of Christ, he's going to understand that because he's loving, he's patient. He came to seek and to save the lost. He, and I'm one of those sinners that had a portion of his grace, but he knows that I just can't handle this. And oh, how we love to see this sympathizing side of Jesus. But there's nothing in my Bible that says Christ came to call sin. He loved the sinner. But he said he came to call sinners to repentance. But you see, friends, we're creating a wrong image of God on the American conscience. 
We've created in our minds through preaching from backslidden pulpits and through our permissive way of life in America. We have created an image of God who is weak, who allows panky panky, who allows anything to go as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process. As long as it's a personal problem and you're not hurting somebody else, you can live with it. And so, consequently, most people say, well, everybody's got a hang up. I don't understand the kind of preaching in America that allows American conscience to believe that God is putting up with what we're having in America. To allow what happened in Dallas, Texas this past summer, you may or may not know that there's an all-homosexual church in America called the Metropolitan Community Churches. They now claim over 50,000 members. They've made application to the World Council of Churches. And the tragedy is that the United Church of Christ two months ago at their General Assembly voted to accept homosexuals as ordained ministers in the United Church of Christ. Three major denominations now have established study committees with a dialogue with the homosexual churches in view of ordaining homosexual pastors. Well, first, they had their Holy Ghost Convention, they called it in Dallas, Texas, this past summer. 2,000 delegates. These are ministers from these churches and their delegates. They called it their Holy Ghost Annual Convention. Now, I couldn't go because they know what I stand for and they'd have kicked me out. So I sent my mother as an underground delegate. My mother is a great ordained minister of the gospel, and she loves people. She doesn't care whether you're homosexual, drug addict. She'll preach the same message in love. Now, friends, I believe in having compassion on homosexuals. I've preached that for years and more understanding in the church. But my message has always been is Christ is the cure, not an excuse. And that the church must never establish a dialogue with the doctrine of devils. But my mother brought that to me, a tape recording of that convention. Now, I've never heard the Hallelujah Chorus sung with such enthusiasm. Power in the blood, I shall not be moved. And then to hear the evangelist stand and misquote from the, from the, from Romans. And you see, the indictment against the homosexual community has been Romans. And they changed that which natural into unnatural desires and God gave them over to reprobate minds. But they say, that's not us. We didn't change anything. We were born this way. That can't be referring to us. That's someone else in society. And see how subtle the enemy is? Say, that's not you. You were born. You couldn't help it. You were created. You were a victim. So this does not point at you. And to hear the misquote, and I heard them say, God has delivered this generation to do as they please. You can be a homosexual. Come out of your closet and worship the Lord. You can talk in tongues. You can do anything and remain as a homosexual. And the thing that bothers me, friends, my mother laid on my desk blushing the registration packet she got. And every delegate got the same pack she got, 2,000 of them. You know what was in that packet? And this blows my mind. Uh, the course sheet and uh, program and two all-nude magazines of nude men and a list of all the gay bars in Dallas, Texas, so that after the meeting you could go out and get drunk and connect. These are ministers. You see, Fred, what has happened to the American conscience, this kind of hypocrisy, we, be, we, are, we, we believe that God's going to let us get away with this, that we're on some fortress island. And God, when we reach the last point, that homosexuals as in Sodom flaunt that which is sacred and holy, that we can get by with it. And we've created in our consciousness in America the fact that God is so weak he'll not deal with sin anymore. There's another kind of hypocrisy, friend, that I don't understand. And these are parents who put their kids down for smoking pot, and they smoke one lucky strike after another. You know, there'll be a, uh, a story in the local newspaper about a drug bust in a local school. And here's dad and mom. They just had supper, and after supper, out comes the cocktail, and out come the cigarettes and the coffee. And they're all lit up, you know, and half stoned. And it goes something like this. Hey, honey, Puff, did you see Puff, that thing in the paper, Puff, those... Crazy kids in high school, Puff, blowing that pot stuff, Puff. Man, dirty, filthy commies, Puff. What in the world does this world come to, Puff? We never did that, Puff, when we were kids, Puff. Puff. So we never did that, man. What's the world coming to? Those crazy kids, Puff. Suck. Now, I watched some of you people coming in here tonight. You couldn't come in and listen to me for one hour till you lit up your cigarette. And you're sitting here now with a pack in your pocket or purse, and you're sitting here like a worm in a bucket of hot ashes, and you'd smoke right now if I'd let you, and you can't wait to get out of here, and you people who smoke are as hooked as any drug addict I've ever worked with. I, I would, and, and tell you, something else, hold, hold it please. 
You know, some, something else that bothers me, something that really bothers me, I call them puffin prophets. Preachers who stand in the pulpit and say, kids, don't smoke pot, don't use drugs, Jesus can keep you clean. And those poor kids sit there scratching their heads and then, so why can't he keep you clean? I was in a crusade recently and I noticed the chairman going, well, alone his seat. I didn't know he smoked. He said, you sure got me in trouble last night preaching like that. My two teenage sons went home and threw all my pipes in the fireplace. I said, I tell you, he's, your kids are trying to say something for you. You may not think smoking or drinking is sinful. Well, we do. You want us to quit smoking pot? We want you to quit smoking cigarettes. What you're sucking is just liquid pot anyhow. And what we need is America as a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost mouthwash. That's right. We need parents who will quit being such hypocrites. All the hypocrisy of the American system now, I reach it everywhere. It's almost impossible for me to preach against drugs in the colleges and high school campuses because of parental and pastoral hypocrisy anymore. The kids will come back to me. You know, the United States government, for example, has one agency that says you can't advertise cigarettes on television anymore and you advertise right on the packet. Surgeon General's determined smoking to be harmful to your health. Isn't that nice? Agency of our government saying don't smoke, it'll kill you. And another agency of the same federal government last year spent $133 million buying cigarettes for food for peace projects to send our cancer by the carton overseas. How do you like that for double standards? How about the school district in Mississippi a few months ago put out a rule that no high school kids could smoke on the campus for the whole district and the third morning they could be expelled. You know the hypocrisy of all? They just spent 30000 for a smoking lounge for the teachers. Hypocrisy. No wonder our kids don't listen. I say this, if you want to smoke and drink, that's between you and God, but you've abdicated your right to preach morals to your kids. Mm-hmm. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Sure glad I got my offering. Now, look, friends, I'm not trying to be cute. I mean it with all my I would tell you another kind of hypocrisy. All you people sitting there saying, give it to them, Davey. Yeah, those smokers, no drinkers. I got something for you. And talk about television. Now, I know some of oh, boy, he's a clothesline preacher. Now, he's one of those holiness preachers. Since when's holiness a dirty word? Now, friends, I don't believe in our, I believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ. I believe that when Christ comes into my life, he becomes my righteousness. He is my holiness. He does not put in me a seed of holiness. He is the holiness. He does not try to extract holiness from me. He has become my holiness and my righteousness, my justification, my sanctification. He's become all the fullness of the Godhead through Christ. But friends, I don't understand the hypocrisy. I've been warning American people now since 1973 when I put out a book called The Vision. I warned of a flood of filth in America. I warned of a flood of filth. Did you see this week's cover of Time magazine? The porno plague in America. I read it and wept. I've never read anything so powerful in my life. How America, and these are liberals who said, we don't understand what's happened. These are liberal, most liberal minds saying, this is not turning out the way we thought it would. In 1973, I warned American people that there was going to be a baptism of filth on America. And I saw the prophecy of the prophet Nahum coming to pass. Behold, saith God, I will pour abominable filth upon you. That doesn't mean that God has a reservoir of smut and filth stored up. No, the devil does, and the Holy Ghost has been the floodgates holding it back, restraining it. But now the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is being lifted because the world is clamoring for nudity and perversion and filth and smut and, and perversion. And God says, all right, that's what you want. That's what you'll get. You're going to be baptized with it. I warned Americans that there was a ship in a New York harbor with $10 million dollars worth of the worst smut to ever come out of Copenhagen. That's already just flooding the United States market. I warned that on television, after midnight, on cable, we'd have X-rated movies. Fifteen American cities now have X-rated movies. New York City is called the Blue, uh, the Blue Service, Blue Series. They have the same Blue Series up in Toronto. They have it in uh, 14 American cities now. Recently, the Devil Miss Jones and Deep Throat played on, on cable on a number of cities in America through college campuses. I had been warning Americans that we'd have full nudity on primetime television. Three weeks ago, NBC had their first full-time nudity and toplessness, and they called it a medical nudity. You see, they're coming in. It's called medical nudity. How to discover 
uh, cancer. And this was the first trial balloon. And now, friends, it's just opening an avalanche. And friends, I've been saying all along that we were going to have programs that were programmed right in the pits of hell. And the programs like Maud, all in the family, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman would compete with one another to put down everything that's sacred and holy and mock everything that's righteous. And the devil would like nothing better for American people to sit in their living rooms and laugh and mock at everything that's sacred and holy. You know what they're talking about now. They're talking about all kinds of subjects that were once taboo. And now anything goes. Cursing. Uh, I, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles a few weeks ago for the burial of Miss Catherine Coleman on Tuesday. And I couldn't make it. I had the flu. And someone called me. I was at home resting. And someone called me. Said, Mr. Wilson, please turn on Channel 5 right now. And on Channel 5 at 3.30, there's a program called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman that plays. And I turned it on. I couldn't believe it. They were mocking Catherine Kuhlman. There was a healer who was laying hands on somebody in a wheelchair, and the lady fell right out. And they did everything but name Catherine Kuhlman. And I, I, I wanted to scream because the irony of it is that that very hour they were burying Catherine Kuhlman. I said, God, the devil won't even let her get in the ground. On the Johnny Carson show, David Fry, the comedian, has learned to mimic Billy Graham. And at the end of his presentation, he got his hands and knees, looked right in the camera, and said, please send me all your money from my books and records and sermons. I want to be a millionaire. And the crowd went crazy, stomping. And Carson said, that's really funny. You see, if the devil can get us to laugh and to mock a spirit of mirth and frivolity, there was an earthquake the other day. I, I was in that earthquake that hit up there. We were in, in Kentucky last week when that five-state earthquake hit. I was on the 11th floor, and the building began to sway. And, friends, it was a, a terrible experience. And especially that night, I was preaching on the judgment on America and how uh, the massive earthquakes are going to start coming, first smaller than massive earthquakes. And you know the thing that really bothered me? I, I was going through uh, Memphis where the earthquake had really hit hard, and on the front page of the commercial appeal was a whole section earthquake jokes. They were joking about it. You see, this is the very thing that I'm talking about. David said, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Friends, I don't understand how any Christian can even watch a program like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I saw just that episode and a few flashes of two or three others. I said, my God, I can't even look at that. I don't understand some Christian ladies being so addicted to things like as the world turns. I had a, a preacher's wife recently say, Mr. Wolf, I had to quit him for one reason. I found myself applauding, sitting there, urging on in my spirit and applauding divorce and filth. She said, I kept saying, leave him. Run away from him. She said, I found myself applauding and partaking vicariously. The lies. You say, oh boy, now we've got one of those preachers here going to preach against coffee next. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of it. And it goes something like this. There'll be a dirty, filthy movie coming on CBS. And the wife's in getting the coffee pot ready. And the husband's in there and he turns it on. And all of a sudden, there's the promo advertising the film. And there's a filthy scene. And it goes something like, hey, Mabel, quick, quick, quick. You'll never believe what's on television. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And so they sit there and say, my Lord, isn't that awful? What have we, just like Brother Dave said, isn't that awful? And for two hours they sit there watching the whole thing and say, isn't that awful? What are we coming to? Oh, God, help me. Isn't that awful? Look, isn't that awful? And watch the whole brewing thing. Well, if it bothers you and if it convicts you, turn it off. Don't be a hypocrite. And I'll tell you something else, friends. I'm not afraid of this baptism of smut. My Bible has a promise for every God-fearing man and woman that's built his house on the rock. If your house is in Christ and you believe Christ, there's a little knob there. It says off and on. And you're going to have to practice a little discretion from now on because you're being programmed right from hell now. You hear me? It's coming right out of the pits of hell. And you've only seen the beginning. They're going to start taking God's name in vain. Within the next three months, you're going to hear God's name taken in vain in major uh, prime time. God's name in vain now. Four-letter words.
absolute hell breaking loose in our TV tubes. But thank God there's a promise for every Christian. Dad, Mom, you don't have to be afraid if all hell breaks loose. I don't care if all the demons in the hell are unleashed. I don't care if hell does enlarge its borders. My Bible said the man built his house upon the rock and the floods came. The floods of filth and smut and pornography and perversion and could not shake that house because it was on the rock. Thirdly, something the Lord has shown me is that the satisfied sinner is on the verge of committing a sin that is worse than the unpardonable sin. I'm going to preach something you've never heard in your life. I think it's worse than pardonable sin because it's self-inflicted. And it's more tragic than pardonable sin because God is willing to forgive, but man removes himself from God's reach. And it's called a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. And because they refused to retain the knowledge of God, therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. Three places in the Bible. And God gave them over to the wickedness. God gave them up to their uncleanness. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you know what a reprobate mind is? Have you ever met somebody with a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is a mind that is sold out to a lie. A mind which has been telling itself a lie for so long it begins to accept that lie is the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie and may be damned to believe not the truth. Given over to a lie. Oh, how many people I have met that have been given over to a lie. I was at a crusade down in Newport News, Virginia, and a 15-year-old lad, about six feet tall, came, a nice-looking kid. He was a drug pusher, and he needed help, so I took him to my ranch in Texas. And I had a, a five-hour counseling session with him one day, and I said, Bruce, why did you come forward crying like that in my meeting? He said, sir, you were talking about a reprobate mind. He said, Oh, boy, did that hit me. He said, when I was 12 years old, I ran away from home and started selling pot and grass to my friends. And, and for years, I was condemned about it. I thought, I'm ruining the lives of these kids. I'm messing up their minds. He said, but six months ago, the devil planted a little thought in my mind, just a little lie. Bruce, don't condemn yourself anymore. You're not hurting anybody. Don't you know that these kids are being helped through your drugs? Don't you know kids are seeing visions of God? They're getting scared of the devil? Don't you know that they're, they're becoming God conscious through drugs? You are a drug evangelist. You can go out and sell all you want from now on and congratulate yourself. You're doing as much good as any preacher. He said, David, I started going out selling drugs freely. No condemnation. And when I came to your meeting, I was convinced that God had called me, that my whole call in life was to go around selling drugs, opening kids' minds so they could have psychedelic revolutions and see God and angels and demons through drugs. He said, and I was almost convinced that that was my call in life. The reason I was put on this earth was to be a drug evangelist. He said, now that may seem crazy to you, but he said, I was believing that lie. And when you talked about being turned over to a lie, the Holy Spirit rebuked me for that. He said, the fear of God came on me and I ran down the aisle trembling. He said, David, if I hadn't come forward to your meeting, I'd have gone out and sold myself to this lie. I'd have been busted. That has sent me up for 30, 40 years, and I've been spending 30, 40 years sitting in prison saying, why? I didn't do a bit of harm. I was just helping. And he said, I tremble to think that I almost sold out to that lie. I was believing that lie was the truth. My wife and I counseled a young 19-year-old girl who fell in love with a married doctor in her city. He had three lovely children and a beautiful wife. And this girl said she was losing her mind. She said, I can't eat or sleep. This is tearing me apart. I love this man. I believe that God brought us together, but I don't want to hurt his wife, and I don't want to hurt those three precious little children. He, she said, and I don't know what to do. She said, I love him. She said, I, I love him so much. And we get together, and we pray and read our Bible, and I know that I minister to his spiritual needs. And she said, I, I know God brought us together. I understand him. His wife doesn't understand him, and I do. What am I going to do? And my wife and I sat there for two hours showing her from the scriptures she was living in adultery and fornication, that God would never appease it, that it was of hell, that she was being given over to a lie. And after two years, or two, two hours of preaching to her, when it was all done, we started to realize she hadn't heard a word we said. Because she said, I don't care what you say. Somehow, I believe God brought us together, and he's going to make it possible for us to stay together. What he, she was actually saying, I hope his wife dies so I can get him. That girl's going to wind up in a mental institution. 
She's given over to a lie. Nobody can reach her. Nobody can touch her. Her mind is shut. I met the worst reprobated minds in my life down in Mexico City. I went down for some crusades in the bullfight arena down in Mexico City a few years ago. And something powerful happened. See, in Mexico City, they have one of the world's biggest prisons. The Lucumberry Prison has over 5,000 inmates. And in the inner section, the security section, they have a security section with over 200 murders and rapists. And about eight, nine years ago, a Baptist missionary had distributed hundreds of my book to cross and switch blade throughout the prison. And of all things, a revival broke out in the section where the murders and rapists were, and 26 got saved. And one of them took a correspondence, the Brian Bible study course, and became a licensed minister. Well, when they found out I was in Mexico City for crusades, they asked me to bring the crusade into the jail. So I was happy to go. I didn't know all the story. I went through all these security gates, and the guard was saying, hey, man, where are you going? I said, the central security. He said, man, they got murders and rapists in there. I said, I know that's where the revival is. He almost had a coronary. He didn't know what I was talking about. I walked inside that last gate. They slammed it shut. Twenty-six men lined up. The pastor, Brother Delgado, about that tall Mexican in his mid-forties, I imagine, a Bible under his arm, smiled mirror to ear. Praise the Lord, Brother Dave. I got read. I got saved reading your book, The Cross and Switchblade. I'm pastor of the church. Luke and Barry, Berean Church. I want you to meet my associate pastor. These are my deacons. This is my mission secretary. These are my elders. Had a whole thriving church inside that prison. They, they put a table out in the courtyard and asked me to preach. I preached my heart out for half an hour. I gave an invitation. And I was heartbroken. Only five, six men came forward. I went around later. I stayed an hour or two to talk to the, these fellows. I never heard such reprobated foolishness in my life. One said, we don't need a preacher. We need a good lawyer. And every one of those men, they're going to die there. There's no way they're ever going to get out there for life or murder, rape, and all kinds of armed robberies and things. And you know what everyone said? Well, we're going to get out of here. They thought either Castro would invade Cuba or or would invade Mexico and set them free or because they're in an earthquake zone, the earthquake would knock the walls down or their case would be reviewed and and they would be released. One man in his 60s, I'm getting out of here and they're going to die there. Yet they're kept together by this lie. They live on a lie. Their minds completely closed to any message outside of that little lie given over to it. I was in Florida, just finished the meeting, got in my car to go to the motel and to knock on the window. I rolled it down. An 80-year-old man stuck his head in the window. He said, hi, David, I'm Joe. I said, Joe, am I supposed to know you? He said, yeah, Harkins Market, Braddock, Pennsylvania. Well, when I was a kid, 15 years old, I worked at a Harkins Market in Braddock near Pittsburgh. And there was a man by the name of Joe who lived on the block that used to shop there. And I used to preach at him every time he came in. He said, that's me. I retired and moved to Florida. He said, you know, David, I'm supposed to be dead. I had a terrible heart condition, and they did open heart surgery and took a vein out of my leg and put it in my heart. I've had a new lease on life. I said, Joe, were you in my meeting tonight? He said, yeah, and you preached at me again. I said, oh, you got saved. You came here to tell me. He said, no, sir. I said, Joe, I preached at you when I was 15 years old, years ago. And now I come full circle, and I'm preaching crusades, and I come to your city, you come to hear me preach, and there was enough conviction there tonight that you could touch it and feel it. And you didn't come forward? No, sir. I said, Joe, you should be dead in hell now, and you know it. Yes, sir. Are you ever, before you die, are you ever going to make Jesus Lord of your life? No, sir. I said, I got a couple old phony friends, and we drink a little and play cards, and he said, i got a philosophy at the end. Everything works out. I'm not like those kids you preach to. He said, I'm no junkie. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't kill nobody. He said, I'm going to make it. Don't worry about me. That man's going to die and go to hell. And he's closed out. He just sit there while I preached amused. Just amused. Oh, how this hurts me. I can go up into Harlem, and I can preach to prostitutes and alcoholics, and they run to Christ. And I can go to churches where there are good nicks, I call them goodniks and smuggies. And they sit there smug in their sin. They've sat through 10,000 Jesus songs. They've heard a 1,000 Holy Ghost messages. They've walked out of a 1,000 Holy Ghost invitations. And they've grown hard in their hearts. And they're being given over to a reprobate mind. 
Now, if you sit here tonight and the Holy Ghost begins to prick your heart and you feel uneasy and you feel pulling and tugging, you can thank God that's the Holy Spirit deal, still dealing and striving with your heart. But if you sit here tonight saying, well, nothing moves me, I feel absolutely nothing, I would say you're on dangerous ground because the Holy Spirit's here tonight. The Holy Spirit is here to save and the Holy Spirit's here to heal and change your life. And all, I, I believe this with all my heart. The coming of Jesus is right at the door. Some people call that the rapture. Now, that term's not in the Bible. Some people call it the capture. That's not in the Bible either, so mine's just as good. I call it the evacuation. He's going to evacuate all the Jesus people in the twinkling of an eye. And friends, I believe that that moment's coming down upon us so fast. I believe it's right at the door. The Bible said right at the door. There's just a thin tissue between time and eternity. And friends, I don't understand how people, with this I'm going to close, I don't understand people who can sit in a meeting like this and stay satisfied with the way they are. And the hardest people in the world to reach are those with, with that the, are married and settled and, and, and they're at ease. And, and uh, they're good church people and they're good society members. And, and uh, they come to meetings like this and, and they hear me preach and they say, hey, that's all wrong. Or others will be convicted of their sin and my associates will come and say, David, you should have been out in the foyer as people were walking. Some of them were ash and white. Some of them were leaning on their friends and they go out in the cool air and shake off the conviction. I see it. I see it everywhere. And if I had my way, I would go up and down every aisle tonight, one by one, toe to toe, eye to eye with everybody in this building, up in the balcony behind me. And I'd point a finger with love right in your heart and say, are you really ready? Are you ready now? You know in your heart, God's put it in your heart, you know that the end of all things are near. You know that the thing is coming upon us now we've been preaching about for years. And yet people get up and walk out. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I go home at night and I cry at my motel room and say, oh God, I preach my heart out. There were people there living in their sin, hypocrites, phonies, 95 percenters who've given Jesus 95 percent, but they've been holding back. They've been cheating on God. And friends, one of these days, the Bible said, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold it. You and I are going to stand before God. We answer for the message we hear. And I, I'm on a life and death mission now. I don't care what anybody thinks of my preaching. I've got nothing left to prove. I have absolutely nothing to prove. I've got no ladder to climb. I've got a pulpit always waiting for me on the streets. I'm here to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit has sent me here, and he brought you here tonight to deal with your sin. Be sure your sin will find you out, and God will not let you go out comfortable in your sins like you were when you walked in. God is dealing tonight before his coming with every one of us. I, I was listening to the news recently, and uh, boy, they were talking about Lebanon exploding. They were talking about the danger of war in the Middle East. They were talking about the drought that's spreading in the Midwest. They were talking about this uh, indentation they found in California now. I don't know if you've heard about it from Palm Springs through Palmdale, right above the San Andreas Fault, about 100 miles. There's a strange indentation of the earth now, and scientists say that there's all kinds of activities in the San Andreas Fault. I was listening to all of these reports, and I, I fell asleep in kind of a daze with these things ringing in my mind. And suddenly in the middle of the night, I had a beautiful experience. Uh, I was awakened in the presence of the Lord Jesus had flooded the room. Have you ever had an experience like that where you wake and suddenly the whole room was aglow with the presence of the Savior? Oh, his presence had filled the room. I tried to get up. It was just like a gentle hand pushed me back down. I started to laugh. I was exhilarated. I just, I was, I, I kept saying, Lord, you're in the room. You're here right now. You said you'd never leave us. You'd never forsake us. I sense your presence. I sense your presence. They that come to him must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. And Lord, I've been seeking you, and I know you rewarded me right now with your uh, demonstration of your presence. You're in this room. And suddenly, I began to realize that all I've been preaching about the coming of the Lord is about to happen. This is the generation that shall not pass. Till all these things come to fulfillment. My granddad preached it. My dad preached it. Now I'm the fourth generation of preachers in my family preaching the coming of the Lord, but that I am living, and the Lord made it so real, I am living in the generation that will not pass till it's all fulfilled. And suddenly, a revelation of God gets my heart. It's coming. We're nearing the hour. We're nearing the time. And suddenly, the nearness of the coming of the Lord, not only the Father knows that day, but oh, I, I believe the Holy Spirit was prompted in my heart for this. All the signs pointed to it. 
And suddenly, I, I thought of all the terrible things happening in the world, and the chaos. I jumped up right in the bed. My wife must have thought I was having a fit. And I yelled at the top of my voice, I'm so glad I'm saved! Where do the people go now for comfort? Where do they go? I know what happens to me. When you hear an evil report, what do you do? You go to the secret closet. You turn it over to your faith. And you deal with it.